Hey, welcome back for the second lecture for class, um, the very final class where we're talking about my disenfranchised grief article. And um, this is another uh, one of the articles that I wrote based on my own experience as a hospice chaplain. And um, some of you I know are doing some hospice work on the side or there. Some of you are also uh, kind of... Uh, experiencing ministries that have some elements of hospice to them or similar to hospice. Um, so I was thinking as I was reflecting on this time about a, an event where I just hit a wall in my ministry and I couldn't, Sitting, I was sitting in the break room in our hospice offices and just kind of broke down in tears and the woman in quality control came by. And she, she talked to me a little bit about what, was, what I was going through and she just encouraged me to kind of go home. Um, so there might kind of I don't know, you might be thinking about moments of your own kind of hitting a wall or signs of burnout in your ministry. Um, the big idea of this article, and this article has been one of, one of the most popular of my, of my articles uh, for some reason. The big idea of this article is that ministers often have kind of crystallized chronic grief that's ungrieved uh, because they go through kind of a secondary loss in, in the middle of their grief work. Um, and that becomes uh, disenfranchised because they don't have anybody to talk about it with. Um, and so disenfranchisement, um, there's four factors that go into being having grief disenfranchised. And I, I want you to pay careful attention to this because it's really much better than I feel like I've described disenfranchised grief before in the class. One is a person is considered incapable of grief um, for developmental or other reasons. Two, significant relationships are unacknowledged or, un or stigmatized. Three, rituals which enable grief are missing. And four, person may feel unworthy to grieve. And so if you look at those uh, pieces together, you might think about what uh, factors might make it so that a minister might face some of those disenfranchised kinds of grief. Um, so multiple losses can contribute to kind of an underlying grief in ministry. And... Uh, as a result, ministers might kind of just keep going and feel busy, but not really grieve their own grief. Some signs of uh, encountering chronic stress in your ministry are unre unreality, floating time, time slowing down, avoidance, or automation. Um, and I quote uh, James Dittes, who talks about people who just go through the motions, kind of protecting their visions by abandoning them. And so I kind of asked myself about a set of practices that uh, might be used to counteract disenfranchised grief. And I include some practices that foster continuing bonds. So kind of giving thanks for the people who you've lost in your ministry and who have shaped uh, that ministry. And so I, I think of some ways in which ministers might uh, refuel by connecting with the, the legacy of those that they've lost. Um, and that might even lead to a kind of sense of... Uh, feeling someone really present with you in your ministry, even as you continue to care for others. Um, so the big idea is that disenfranchised grief makes you forget, but so many of the resources of faith are used to help you remember. Um, and so you might think about what are your personal um, practices of remembrance after disenfranchised grief? Um, are there ways in which uh, you try to bring back uh, the memories of someone or honor their legacy um, I think there's also certain limits to this. So, um, the, the, in, in the article, I talk a little bit about touching base with families and in bereavement care, but I also think occasionally I've had people who've reached out to me long after uh, I lost them in hospice, and I, I haven't always reached out to provide follow-up care, but rather left that to the hospice staff or bereavement professionals. And so there's times in which I think uh, you stop caring too, in a sense that you, uh, you're you no longer paid, you're no longer in that ministry role, and you kind of uh, foster someone else's care for that person rather than doing it yourself. Um, so you might a couple of questions that come to mind as I reread this article are, so what are, what are some things that can be done to avoid the, the boundary crossing in terms of if ministers f kind of feel like they're grieving at work and they're, they're experiencing loneliness in their personal life, maybe... Uh, what are some ways they might seek to get their attachment needs met in their ministry, and how might that be unhealthy? Um, I also uh, might be asking kind of um, 
what are some practices, contemplative kind of uh, grieving practices that ministers can re-engage in order to remember people that have been important to them? And how might that help with the kind of chronic burnout that shows up in people just going through the motions in their ministry? So you might be thinking today, uh, our in our tech culture, in other ways that we engage with one another in this particular time, what are some ways that we can uh, continue to care for the disenfranchised grief of our own ministries and of the ministries of one another? I think there's actually some, with new technologies, there's more ways to do this now than when I first wrote this article. So um, be aware of the impact that your ministry is having on your own soul and spirit, and be aware of the ways in which uh, you might experience interpersonal. In, uh, you might experience harm from your ministry, um, especially if you find yourself carrying a lot of the burdens of your work, and that kind of impacting your own uh, spiritual life. Um, then it's time for you to kind of have a place where you can feel remembered, whether that's therapy or spiritual direction or uh, just spiritual friendship, some place where you can uh, let your hair down and relax and not be in your professional role. Um, so you might be thinking about um, some ways to re-enfranchise your grief work as you go on and you want to be a, a support to people in ministry. Maybe there's a particular way that you can honor those who you've lost and uh, also uh, move on and grieve some of those losses, reorganize uh, after those losses, but also honor the continuing bonds that do persist after a loss. Uh, and give, give thanks for the, the many voices of the communion of saints that surround us. Okay, thank you so much for engagement in, in these videos. And uh, I pray that, that these will lead to a more integrated and fulfilling uh, ministry in grief and loss, whatever uh, form of loss that you feel called to, and whatever your distinctive capacities are uh, in terms of listening to the loss of others and, and at the same time caring for your own losses. Okay, God bless.